Our first question for tonight goes. Dear Lungpo, this is a question about a meditation method I use with Buddha Nusati. The first step is keeping the mind on the last five syllables of the Itipiso Sutta, i.e. Buddha Bhagawa. After the mind settles, the five syllables are reduced to three syllables only, Bhagawa. After the mind quietens even more, the mantra is reduced to, to two syllables, Guddo. Even though this method involves a mantra that changes slightly and is not keeping the mind on just one object for the entire meditation session, I find it helps to stop the mind from scattering. Is this method acceptable in the forest tradition? Does Ajahn have any other advice? Oh, it's definitely acceptable. If you listen or read Ajahn Chah's teachings, you, know, you can see he accepted sometimes we would be quite, might need to be quite creative in our practice of meditation, training the mind and also in the way we use techniques. The rule of thumb really is if it works, why not? You know, and the textbooks, whether it's the actual suttas or commentaries, you know, they give you a framework, the sort of basic framework. But there's also room for a little bit of experimenting and just seeing what works for you personally with your character. And one of, if you read the sutra on the Buddha's, the Buddha's suttas on the teaching on the removal of distracting thoughts, one of the ways he talks about bringing the mind to a place of samadhi, one-pointedness, is slowing it down, as it were. Just like someone running and then walking and then standing and then sitting down. So what you've just described could be something in that vein where you, you start with something a bit more involved, the five syllables, and then you're noticing your state of mind as you're becoming more calm. You go to three syllables and then one syllables. Actually, if you continue with this method, eventually you would stop all recitation. When the mind becomes very calm, still, one-pointed, even the one or two syllables of Buddha you would drop, and you're just with the knowing. But don't drop the syllables and the recitation too quickly, because ordinary thinking will flood back in probably. But if you become really calm, whether sitting or walking, eventually you might get to the point where you don't even need Buddha. You don't need to recite any word and your mind is just with itself, knowing itself. And all the great practitioners have said this, you know, Lumpur Man, Lumpur Cha, you, know, you recite whether it's Buddha, Buddha, or Itipiso, or Buddha, Bhagawa, they are all good, Buddha, Dhammo, Sango, any phrase, or word from Pali, or you could even use a phrase or a word in English is fine, or your own language if you're not English. It's fine, but what you find is as the factors of samadhi arise, your mind becomes more refined. You don't need such a coarse object. So if you have many words, you may recite down to one, reduce it down to one word. And even one word you may reduce and eventually let that go and just stay with the knowing itself and no words need to be there. It's a step-by-step -step process, but you're slowing the mind down. As you say, the mind is normally scattered, distracted, so sometimes in the beginning you need to give it much more to work on, and then later reduce everything down to one simple object. So what you're doing sounds good to me, carry on. Sato. Next question. Dear Ajahn Kalyano, thanks for expounding the Dhamma for us. May I know how can one learn to put others' needs above oneself willingly and not put one's needs above others? Recently, I see it clearly for myself that I am a person with strong view of self and I tend to impose my values onto others 
due to my judgment, judgment habitual tendencies. For example, thinking this could be better for the individual, etc. How can I work towards being a real compassionate being? Uh, well, I think you've understood the problem. This is why the Buddha encouraged us to develop what we call the Brahmaviharas, Dhammas, these four sublime abidings, metta, goodwill, karuna, compassion, mudita, sympathetic joy, upekha, equanimity. Really they all arise out of metta, or different aspects of metta. And even in, sometimes when they do the, make the statues of Brahma, who kind of symbolizes these four qualities, you know, it's one statue with four faces in different directions, because they all are very closely linked. You're only working with your one mind, you only have one mind, but you, these four different aspects of the mind need to be developed equally, you might say, and they support each other, and sometimes one will be more applicable in certain situations than the other. But another part of it is when you practice metta, for example, or karuna, compassion, you're practicing to all beings. So in any situation, you're one being in all in the group, or if there's two of you, you're one of those two, or if you're in a whole group, you're one of that whole group. Just as an idea, we tend to think of goodwill as something you're sending out to the world, <clears throat> whether it's to family, friends, all be or all beings everywhere, and you kind of forget yourself. It's very natural we forget ourselves. So then, sometimes we get confused by that or make have a misunderstanding because of that. You're still there as one of these beings that you're cultivating metta or karuna for. So like you say, sometimes you um, impose your own views and what you think is right on others. So there's a whole range of things, it's hard to generalize here, but you know, there's a whole range of things that might be important if you're developing kindness towards others. You, you have to think who is the person you're trying to help or you're um, developing kind thoughts for. So if it was your child or your new Dhamma friend who's a bit younger and inexperienced you, well maybe there's a lot you can share with them and a lot more you can do for them. But if you're, the other person is someone who's more experienced or more knowledgeable or older than you, maybe there's less that you can do for them. And so to do a lot to try and help them or even teach them may actually um, be out of place or <coughs> inappropriate. That's one, just one aspect you have to look into, you know, who is it that you're trying to help or what is the situation. Then of course there's different, th ways we help each other you know you have basic goodwill for everyone that would be one goal isn't it to develop in all directions all beings in all realms all situations you're developing goodwill but you always have to be realistic there'll be many beings in the world that you may wish well but very little you can do to help them practically verbally or even mentally all you can do is wish them well but there's not a lot you can actually do for them. So you have to balance your metta with some wisdom and some equanimity. So these four Brahma Viharas, you know, they work together. So even yourself sometimes, you are suffering and you wish yourself well because nobody wants to suffer. But maybe there's not much you can do other than just be patient with it because it's going to take time to get through whatever the suffering is. Good example is you're ill. You know, nobody wants to be ill. If you're ill, you would like to recover and get on with things. But that's not always possible, or it may at least take time. So you have to have equanimity with your goodwill there. And the same with someone else. You may have someone you love and you want them to recover, but it's going to take time. So you need the equanimity to help you balance your expectations 
and to help you understand karma or they're experiencing the fruits of their karma. I wish them well, but there's maybe nothing you can do in that situation other than wish them well. So these subtle aspects of the practice of metta and karuna, compassion, and mudita and, and upeka, you, know, you, you have to reflect on them and develop some wisdom around the, these brahma-viharas as well as developing them as basic attitudes of mind, also as basic meditations. And you know, even the Buddha said he can't help everyone in the world we say the Buddha had complete one-pointed universal loving kindness. You know, when he radiated loving kindness, it went in all directions. Everyone had the opportunity to receive the benefits of that, the Buddha's loving kindness as he radiates it throughout the whole universe. But he also said he can't help everyone, meaning he wishes them all well, but there'll be some people who are so stuck in their ways or stuck in their problem or the problem is so um, deep that you know the Buddha even the Buddha couldn't pull them out of their suffering maybe in that life maybe in a future life there may be hope for them but maybe at that time they're just too deep deeply involved in whatever the problem is that even the Buddha couldn't help them he couldn't teach everyone say so you have to remember that part of it as well. You know, our number one priority is know yourself, teach yourself, take responsibility for yourself because no one else can do it for us. But as you say, you have to discern is, is what you're doing coming from defilement, selfish self-interest, which may also lead to harming others, or is your self-interest coming from the Dhamma it's coming from a place of genuine goodwill and some wisdom where you know sometimes it is appropriate to give yourself more time to for practice and doing good for yourself because then later we might be able to help people properly if we don't help ourselves properly it's going to be hard to help anyone else we'll get it wrong so there's some a certain amount of balance going on here and it won't always be the same either you, there'll be times when you have to be more take more time for yourself, have a rest, or just take more time, go on retreat and so on for yourself. And there'll be times when you're in a position where you have to give more and you rely on whatever you've learned, whatever good qualities you have, that's supporting you as you give and help others. But as you say, you know, we can get burnt out, so you have to be able to observe yourself and adapt and adjust as well. And so practice is always involves developing some discernment, some wise reflection on your own position and what's going on. You can't just have a fixed view and say, oh, you should always be <laughs> kind to other people and doing things for other people. Generally that's true, but there'll be times when you have to be kind to yourself maybe and have a good rest, such as when you're ill or exhausted. If you're ill, you don't expect to go out and do a lot for the rest of the world when you're ill because you've got to fix yourself first. So, you know, nothing is uh, fixed or it's not, you know, you can't just give a simple answer here, can you? You have to learn how to, how to reflect on what's going on in your practice and in your life and then adjust accordingly. <laughs> Another question. Dear Ajahn, in our meditation practice, what do we do when aversion or craving or anger rises? Can you explain to us again what is the right view and right effort to have and apply? How can we prevent tanha from arising in the first place? Thank you. Well, all, all the aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path will help. There's not one thing or another. Um, you know, right view begins with just listening to a Dhamma or reading, absorbing some information. So you've got a few good ideas there and some reflections to help you. Associating with fellow Dhamma practitioners, teachers helps as well. But you have, then you have to apply it in your own life. So we have to learn how to have a bit of moral discipline and composure in daily life, what we call precepts, 
mindful practice mindfulness of what we're doing, what we're saying, and reflect on what we're doing and saying to see whether we're causing ourselves or others a lot of harm. You know, that's usually how you begin, isn't it? You notice that you have a few bad habits, you lose your temper in certain situations or with certain people. You reflect on it, you realize this is no good, you're suffering, they're suffering, so then you want to change. That wanting to change is a desire for freedom from suffering. How do you change? We have to watch what you say. <laughs> you know, a lot of this is very obvious, basic stuff that we've been told over and over again, but it's, we're always forgetting ourselves. So you have to practice a lot of mindfulness of what you say and what you do through life and get to know the danger p points, you know, the triggers, your blind spots. So sometimes you hear feedback from others, sometimes you just reflect on what went on in your day, say, and you reflect, oh, shouldn't have said that, shouldn't have done that, look how angry I am, and look, I took it out on this other person. So it's about gradually becoming more and more aware, first of your external interaction with the world, what you say, what you do, but if you develop meditation, well, you're becoming much more subtly aware as well of your moods and you know, over time you may be able to reduce everything back to your mind and just know certain feelings of tension, displeasure come up, triggered by you know, simple not getting what you want or unpleasant situations. This unpleasant feeling is the beginning of craving, isn't it? Craving arises dependent on feeling. So pleasurable feeling tends to make us want, we like it, want more. Unpleasant feeling we don't like, we want to get rid of, or you know, it has a destructive effect on the mind. It's equally addictive, you know, we can get addict addicted to getting angry just as we can get addicted to pleasure. That addictiveness is coming from a lack of awareness, lack of mindfulness, lack of insight. So we have to cultivate mindfulness and insight a lot. Meditate a lot, listen to the Dhamma a lot, reflect on your behavior a lot. And on these three levels, body, speech and mind. And we're all the same. When we start practicing Dhamma, all we can see is defilement and problems in every direction. Oh, so much suffering in my life, I think too much, I'm too angry, I'm too greedy, I'm too worried, I'm too afraid. And it comes out in my what I do, my relationships and this and that. You know, you see all the problems first and it's overwhelming, but you have no choice but to be very patient and just keep going. And one of the most beautiful things I've seen in my life as a monk is Ajahn Chah Sangha is massive. Thousands of monks and nuns and millions of lay people, I obviously don't know them all, but I'm, over the years I've met many people and sometimes, you know, there's people I still know after 40 years in the Sangha, say monks like me who came into the Sangha around the same time or that I knew when I first came into the Sangha and I still know today. And over 40 years, you can see people change for the better. And most people come into the Sangha or start associating with the Sangha, maybe lay people. Of course, they are full of defilements. <laughs> Greedy, angry, talk too much, sleep too much, this too much, that too much. You know, everybody has their stuff. No one's any different when they start. But over the years you see people change and that's beautiful isn't it you see ch people change for the better they shed some of the worst defilements you know they like i was saying in the talk you know people who lose their temper easily and are always threatening to punch someone else usually the guys but not always <laughs> i've known a few women who've been pretty violent <laughs> But over time, practicing, they change and they see the error of their ways and they become mindful. Oh, I can't do that. I can't throw a punch. I, I won't do that anymore. Or I'm somebody who's always getting angry, so I'm going to be really careful and not give in to my anger so much. Or people are really greedy and always you know, seeking to get the best things and the most things for themselves to the expense of other people maybe changing. 
learning to be more generous, more relaxed, letting go a bit. And when you see people over a long period of time, 20, 30, 40 years, you realize, oh, there's hope for us all because the Sangha is full of many different kinds of people, different characters. And you know, you'll find someone in the Sangha somewhere who's a bit like you. <laughs> and you can say, oh, if they can do it, then I can. So we, we used to have a joke in Thailand at Wat Nana Chat. We say, you know, all the monks are a bit like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in the sense that, you know, there's the sleepy one, the greedy one, the grumpy one, the this one, the that one. You'll find every character type in the Sangha, but over time, they learn how to manage their own personality, their weaknesses, let them go, develop the strengths, and change. And that's the inspiring thing, isn't it? You see people change, you realize, ah, everyone can change through, for the better, but it has to come through patient effort, practice, reflection. So just keep going, don't give up, don't be disappointed with when you see a defilement, just use that as something to learn from. <laughs> Sadhu. Next, we have a raised hand. Hello, Tanajan. Hello. Greetings from London. Oh, London. Um, okay. Yes. So, <laughs> I didn't really have a question, but I just wanted to thank uh, Tanajan for all your talks on uh, Spotify. Those have been really useful. Okay. And all your your posters, especially the one about suffering lasting for a very short time, except we carry it with us. Uh, it's been very popular amongst my friends. And I think, we, although we all know we have to practice, it's really, I would love a hack or two that you tell yourself, especially when you're tired, to meditate. Yeah, I, I try all sorts of ways to, to, to conquer the mind. You know, but some days it just doesn't work. So how has Tanajan been able to do it? What do you tell yourself in the early days? I'm sure you were struggling to, uh, to motivate yourself to just keep going as you just, uh, as Tanajan just advised. Thank you. Well, hello everyone in London. Haven't been back there for many years, but uh, <laughs> I do go to England, but I tend to go to the monasteries now. Um, well, when I started meditating, I lived in London actually. So I would have a lot of resistance to getting up in the morning. I said I should get up earlier, then I have more time to meditate. So, and I'd have sometimes have a lot of resistance. So, oh, I don't want to get up. Why do I have to get up? <laughs> you have a little argument with yourself. So I always found Ajahn Chah very helpful. He'd just say, look, he had this phrase, if if it's no good, let it die. If it doesn't die, make it good. He uses death quite a lot as a sort of simple way to say, look, you've really got to let these bad habits die. Just let them go, finish with them. Or even sometimes if you're really stubborn and you really want to change yourself, you say, I'd rather die than give in to my laziness or my greed or my anger. I'd rather die. So you kind of th threaten yourself, but you know, you're just saying, it's just a way of talking, you're not actually doing anything. I used that quite a lot in the beginning because I found that brought up a bit of commitment, a bit of strength uh, to overcome my own laziness, resistance, whatever. The other thing would be like, sometimes I'd get peaceful, even sitting in South London, meditating in a house, teenager, most of my life was not very skillful, but occasionally I had a nice peaceful meditation once in a while and I would say, that's why I'm doing it and then I'd try and remember that and I'd use that as a kind of reminder, oh I can be peaceful, so if I'm not peaceful, why not? And usually it's you're not trying hard enough, you're too lazy, you know, something like that. So you, you find what inspires you. Sometimes you have to be tough with yourself, just let it die. Sometimes you have to remind yourself of something good or inspiring, either a personal experience or sometimes, you know, think of the Buddha or a teacher. You have to find for your personality what works. 
and then you do it. And what you usually find, what I find is like, you know, if you're feeling really resistant to meditation, you'd rather just sleep or whatever else it is you like to do that's not meditation. When that's coming up and there's a sort of choice to be made, I just sort of resign myself to the fact that I should meditate because that's the way out of suffering and whatever else the alternative is, is not the way out of suffering, it's the way to more suffering. So I just say, ah, oh, just do it. You're feeling tired, lazy, just do it anyway. Which is the kind of thing you get from someone like Ajahn Chah, is this sort of attitude of, you know, you feel like doing it, you do it. You don't feel like doing it, you still do it. You just keep telling yourself that. <laughs> Remind yourself. Sarulumpo. <laughs> Another question. In many suttas, the Buddha talked about immoral versus virtuous people. Are the five or eight precepts the only standard for deciding if someone is moral, immoral or virtuous? Well, it's not the only factors, but it's a very good starting point, isn't it? Um, if someone's still killing, yeah, that's not very good. <laughs> Even killing animals, not very good. If they're still harboring that intention and following it through, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying and abusive speech, getting drunk, you know, it's fairly obvious these are not very good for our spiritual development. If someone uh, is working on it, well, you always have to give them time. We can't be too judgmental. And the Buddha pointed out when, when you do keep precepts, you one of the defilements, the subtle defilements the, or the conceits that will come up, you tend to look down on people who don't keep the same precepts as you or less precepts or worse precepts. You tend to look down, so you've got to watch that. That comes more with the meditation and mindfulness, rooting out self-view and even attachment to something like virtue. It can still be a cause of suffering because you might get angry with other people who don't keep precepts or not as virtuous as you. So you have to still reflect when you keep precepts. But at the same time, they're very useful, training rules. And if you're in a position to keep eight precepts, it's very supportive for meditation practice, in particular for developing samadhi, simplicity of life, using your time, really devoting your time to meditation. So. You know, most people on meditation retreats keep eight precepts or visitors come and stay in the monastery, they keep eight precepts. Um, but that doesn't mean to say keeping five precepts is somehow inferior. It may be necessary if you have family, work commitments and so on. But the precepts are a very simple, clear kind of way to start managing your behavior and becoming aware of what you're saying and doing and having a way to measure that on a daily basis. You know, I would recommend every day reflect, am I keeping the five precepts? Because choices come up all the time. And do I kill the fly or do I let it go? I live in the forest, so that kind of choice comes up all the time. But nowadays I just don't think of killing, I just shoo it away or endure it or something. Um, and the same with speech, you know, do I tell this lie or do I just keep quiet? If you're going to tell a lie, just keep quiet. <laughs> you, you get better at it the more you practice. Obviously, one day you don't really need to think about precepts anymore if your mind becomes really much more attuned or aware of what is wholesome and unwholesome intentions or mental states. You know, until you get to that point, and that may be quite a long way into your practice, precepts are a very skillful way to develop an understanding of virtue. And I would say now, it's just better for you if you keep the five precepts. If you don't keep the five precepts, what happens? If you drink or take drugs, what happens? All kinds of problems. I know, I did it before. <laughs> If you tell lies or you abuse people, what happens? So you lose people's respect and friendship. 
if you sleep around or you don't, you're not honest with your partner and you treat people not very well in your sexual relations, you're going to suffer. They're going to suffer, you're going to suffer. If you steal, you're always living with the fear of being found out and your mind is not peaceful. And if you kill, you're harboring a lot of anger and, and unwholesome uh, mental states. The more you practice, the more obvious this becomes, I think. <laughs> So yeah, I would use precepts to start with, but if you can find a better way or a different way, fine, that's all right. But uh, it's just a very direct way to become aware of your mind, your intention, your action. Actually, if you study, you know, go to the suttas, well, there's the ten wholesome ways of action. You sort of expand on the, the five precepts a bit further, but that may come if you study more. So we still have about uh, 10 questions to go. Okay, uh, have to be brief in answer. Next one is, the suttas say that the merits of giving will bear fruit in one's next life. Can offering dana not bear fruit in this current life? Oh, it can. Of course it can. But the Buddha is helping you to see that there are some kinds of dana, or many kinds of dana, that really have far-reaching consequences for your practice. So generally, you encourage people to develop the idea of offering sangha dana, meaning offering support, material support, in one way or another, to sangha. And sangha includes laity who come and practice in the monasteries and so on. So it's not just monks or nuns, <coughs> offering Sangadana, the results of that follow you every life until Nibbana. And certain kinds of offerings really sort of help you. So like probably a really good one is offering land or you know, it could be a donation towards the purchase of land or offering a piece of land to start a Buddhist monastery such a powerful good karma and you hear so many good stories of people who um, benefit from that they're so happy because it's such a clear kind of giving up of something that was yours if you had a piece of land or the money to buy it and it leads on to so much good over so many generations you know it's like Anattapindika the millionaire in the time of the Buddha you know, he bought Prince Jeta's land, uh, forest by covering it with gold, that was his price. He said, "If you, I'll take as much gold as you can need. You need to cover the whole land of this this forest." So he covered it with gold and basically made himself bankrupt. So all his, all his family and friends and even the devas are going, "Oh, he's bankrupt!" And they're all worried that things are going to go wrong. But of course, in that very life, he became a millionaire again, having given away all his money. It all came back to him in that very life. So that's quite often that will happen. People who give a lot, get a lot back. It makes them happy. And something like giving land just leads on, you know, if you offer land to build a monastery, so many people come to practice and do good there for so many generations. Yeah, it's like, well, this is such an amazing gift to the world. It's only one kind of dana, but, you know, there are these dhanas that will just support you and your practice right through until Nibbana. Um, but if you're very poor, you don't have a lot to give, well, just give one spoonful of rice with an attitude of, I do this for Nibbana, out of respect for Buddha Dhamma Sangha, out of a desire to let go of my own attachment, uh, out of a desire to, compassion to support other people in their practice for Nibbana, even one spoonful, spoonful of rice could lead to a, an amazing realization in your own mind. So when you do give dana, try and keep the reason why, you, why you're doing it and the mindfulness of you know, what your intention is, what the purpose of it is. Keep that clear in your mind. Because unfortunately, when people offer dana, often they get distracted. <laughs> They're doing something very good, but then you know they're talking to their friends, or they forget this or that, and they get very kind of confused. So try not to get confused or distracted when you offer dana in any form, and you'll find it 
definitely supports you in this life as well as future lives. Um, one of the best stories, I, I probably told it before on these Zoom sessions, but one man who offered a piece of forest to Lumpur Anand to start a monastery about an hour's drive from his monastery. He's a very ordinary, humble villager, village headman who had this kind of ideal, I want to offer land to start a monastery because his village didn't have a Buddhist monastery and it's kind of like he always felt there's something missing in his village. In Thailand, you know, most of Thailand is a Buddhist country, most places have a Buddhist temple or monastery there. His didn't. So he offered this land out of compassion, Lumbuan and accepted it, sent monks, Monks stayed there and this man supported it and helped the in initial growth of the monastery, the temple. Then he died of cancer. They had the funeral for him in the monastery on the land that he had offered. And someone at that funeral, just sitting there, a person who didn't normally meditate and wasn't usually into sort of seeing visions or anything like that, a very ordinary person, had this amazing vision seeing the man who had offered the land standing, you, know, you could say the ghost of the man, standing next to his coffin during the funeral as monks are chanting and there's Dhamma talks, and the devas coming down with this kind of heavenly chariot, picking him up, putting him in this heavenly chariot and taking him away. If that isn't a good advertisement for doing a bit of dana, sangha dana, I don't know what is. <laughs> but I'll leave it up to you. you know, trouble is a lot of people are very skeptical. So you tell them a story like that and they go, oh, I don't believe in Davis, I don't believe in next life, blah, blah, blah. Okay, your choice, your risk. <laughs> if you never do any dana, maybe things won't go so well for you. It's just a fact of life. You help other people, you do good things, then good things will come back to you. It's just cause and effect. That's my observation living in the world and I still believe it. I believe it much more than when I started practicing Buddhism. <laughs> I have no doubts now, the, the effectiveness of offering dana. Anyway, next question, time is short. Sadhu, Sadhu. Dear John, my poor eating habits have led to health problems. I reflected on my own failings. Have I been too attached to my work or was it delusion or stubbornness on my part? How can I help myself to be more skillful in my own actions? Well, it's never too late to learn things. We all have to adjust our eating habits as we get older because your body changes and there'll be certain foods that are no longer good for you. I always use the one, you know, your favorite food, which may be bad for you, that's usually the case, isn't it? The, the thing you like most is probably the worst thing for you. That's how life works out, isn't it? It's unfair, I know, but I always think, I don't need to eat it because I've eaten it many times before and enjoyed it, and I can let this time, I can let someone else enjoy it, I've enjoyed it before, I don't need it anymore. You, know, you can do that with the foods that are going to kill you and usually it's those foods that you, you really like. It's like the man who we went to see <laughs> had heart surgery, open heart surgery and he just survived, you know, luckily he's just survived, good. And he comes off his open heart surgery and you know, his wife wants to give, he comes home and she wants to give him his favorite curry which is the one that is all full of oil and stuff, all the bad stuff. And he's like, do I eat it or not? Do I eat it or not? So he, he spent a long time training himself not to eat it because he knew it would kill him. Simple as that. Some foods will kill you, you know, sugar, fat, all the things that are giving you problems. So you need to study a bit, don't you? Listen to your doctor, your people who know about nutrition, get to know what foods are good for you, what are not. And if it's something you like, but you know it's bad for you, just remind yourself, I've had it before, it doesn't matter. 
let it go and, and enjoy it's another form of dana isn't it when you you don't take that food you can have it leave it for someone else in your family or your workplace you can even you know get that food in but don't eat it yourself you just give it away and you remind yourself i'm giving this away it's what i like but i'm giving it away may they be happy so you get more and more goodness out of the event you're getting good health by not having it and you're making other people happy what's the opposite oh keep eating the food i like <laughs> get more and more ill risk killing yourself and you're depriving other people of it as well you know, there's nothing there there's no real happiness there it's just habit so start changing habits it's never too late <laughs> Next question. Dear Ajahn, I often hear people describe experiencing sensations or visualizations during med meditation. While I do feel joy and peace when I meditate, I don't see any images or visualizations. May I check how I can assess the progress of my meditation? meditation? Thank you. Yeah, images and visualizations are not a guarantee of success or they're not something you should be kind of aiming for or hoping for. Just knowing your mind in the present moment, are you mindful or not? So use the five hindrances as the kind of guideline to what's happening in your mind as you meditate. You know, are you mindful enough to let go of sensual desire, which is not easy? Are you mindful enough to let go of your ill will, your bad temper, your anger? Are you mindful enough to let go of your sleepiness, your drowsiness, your sloth and torpor? Are you mindful enough to let go of your restless, anxious states of mind? Are you mindful enough to let go of doubt, which stops you doing anything, doesn't it? Doubt, procrastination, hesitation, skepticism. These five hindrances are a better measure of your meditation of what's going on. These five hindrances are impermanent, they're not self, they can be abandoned, but it takes practice and mindfulness and wisdom and effort. As far as visualizations, images go, one thing that you know all the teachers will say, well, even if you see an image, what do you learn from it? Well, you learn that it arises and ceases. It's impermanent. So it can't really be much of a goal. The goal is more to know that it's impermanent, isn't it? Whether it's a, an image from your imagination, which happens, you create it, or it's an image from a memory, pops up, or if it was an image from some external thing, you see some being, they all have this in common, they arise, they cease, they're impermanent, and they're not self. Of course, if you really get into meditation, you become more mindful, experience samadhi, some people see a lot of images, even then that can be a problem, too many images can be distracting, but you can use certain images to develop a theme of meditation. So an obvious one might be an image of the body. So a common one is to see yourself as a corpse. That kind of image may just arise naturally, or some people develop it. Or an image of a part of the body, you know, the hair or the bone or the heart, and you develop that image and it can give you a lot of insight. But if you don't have such images and you're not aiming to develop such images, it doesn't matter. Just know your mind. Are you peaceful or not? Are you angry or not? Are you greedy or not? Is there anything bothering you or not? Know that much. That's a far more useful goal to you. You need to be mindful, paying attention and reflective to know that, don't you? Those are the qualities you want. In the Buddha, the Buddha talked about the seven factors of enlightenment, the seven bojanga. There's no mention of you've got to see an image, <laughs> see some kind of image or visualization. He's talking about mindfulness, investigation of Dhamma, effort, uh, rapture, tranquility, samadhi, equanimity. Those are the qualities you're developing. You may see images, you may not. So they're kind of more incidental, they're not the heart of the practice. Sarulungu. Next question. What to do when negative thoughts arise in the mind? 
Let them go. <laughs> you don't need them. Yeah, just just shoo them away. Don't give them attention. Don't give them importance. Be patient with them because they love to keep coming back. But don't make it worse than it has to be. Yes. Oh, negative thought on your way. Just just find a way for you to reflect with mindfulness that this negative thought, if I hold on to it, I'll keep suffering. It's just like today. We're out in the monastery working. It's a warm, warmish day. <laughs> the flies come. They keep coming back to you. They land on your hand, your face, here, there. If you make something out of them, you give them a lot of importance, you get upset. So you just shoo them away. And they'll come back, but you just shoo them away and get on, you know, you basically you ignore them. That's what you've got to do with negative thoughts. If you give them importance, make a big deal out of them, they'll keep bothering you and you'll be very unhappy and disturb you and you know, things happen over time. The more you hold on to your negative thoughts, you'll suffer more. So don't give them any, don't feed them, don't give them importance, just let them go and keep doing that. And of course, the other side of it is, well, develop more of the skillful dhammas, the positive things. So if you're, you, know, you tend to have a lot of anger, well, develop metta. If you're very selfish, try to develop more generosity, kindness, compassion. If you're very lazy, well, make yourself get up and do things that are good for you. You know, it's this kind of preventative work. We're developing the, the opposite qualities of whatever the negative thoughts that bother you are. Develop the opposite consciously as a preventative thing. And when the negative show their head, let them go. Don't entertain them. Sadhu, next question. Dear Ajahn, how to disidentify from the from the memory of a difficult experience. For example, the memory of using unskillful words and, sorry, the memory of unskillful words and actions of others who caused big harm to us. When the actual experience did actually happen in reality, so it is not just a memory, but an actual harmful experience that happened. How to prevent anger and aversion from arising? Thank you. Well, it's understandable when these memories come up, they stimulate more feelings and negative thoughts. But you have to be careful. You, you can't say it actually happened. And that probably indicates you're really identifying very strongly with them. Oh, I am this person. This happened to me. And, you know, it's not fair, I didn't deserve this, shouldn't have happened. We become so tangled up in creating a self around this experience that we prolong it, maybe even make it worse than it has to be. Sure, if bad things have happened to us, it's a shame, it's sad, and, and we have to develop some compassion for ourselves. And others will also have compassion for you if they know that you've been through this suffering. But at the same time, you've also got to have a goal. You're aiming to let go of the, the habit of creating or extending the suffering, the life of the suffering, by keep holding on, you know, keep ruminating is the word people keep using with me today. Don't keep ruminating on it over and over again. It happened okay, but let it go. You acknowledge it happened, but then you let it go. It's in the past. It is a memory now. If it's not happening to you now, you know, it's over. Be clear on that. As much as you're clear that it did happen to you, you also have to be clear that it's finished. That's equally true. It's not happening to you now. And everything has changed. Like say, you know, lots of people have trouble from their past. Ten years ago when I was a younger person, this terrible thing happened. Okay. Sometimes you have to reflect within a few years all the cells in your body have changed your mind has changed so many times all the thoughts and feelings come through your mind every day they're changing what is left from 10 years ago yes there is something left there's memory okay but in fact you know you're a totally different person already if you can bring your mind to see that i know it's not easy i'm not saying this is an easy thing to do but basically that's what you're going towards is to see that happened, okay, it happened, but it's finished. 
now I'm different and this, you know, it's in the past. I know it's in the past, now I can let it go. Obviously, it, it's slightly different if there's an ongoing situation where you're suffering things, you know, things are happening to you in your life, things are going wrong right now. Okay, there may be a, a lot more that you have to do. But if it is in the past, a memory, it's more mental, isn't it? You're just working out how to treat this memory skillfully with mindfulness, with insight. Literally, we say it's a memory, a perception is some one part of the five candors. These five candors, we're learning to let them go, whether it's our memory of them in the past, how they are now, or even the future candors that haven't even arisen yet. We're learning to let them go because they're not self. So it's this sense of ownership that tricks us and makes us suffer. So stop carrying it around like you own it. Accept it, let it go. Sadhu. Another question. Dear Ajahn, recently I helped someone with financial issue with money and then he came back to ask for more. I want to help him but I know I can't just keep giving him money. What should I do? Well, don't just keep giving him money. Um, obviously it depends on the situation. Uh, I don't know you and what's going on, but often the people who keep asking for money, they're doing something very unskillful in their life, in some other aspect of their life. And you're like, the, if you're willing to give, you're often like the, the easy solution for them. But you're probably not actually addressing the real problem. So the obvious one is, say, a gambler. This happens all the time. People gamble, so they go to their partner or their parents or somebody to get money. Or a drug addict needs to feed his habit, her habit, so they go someone to get the money. So the problem is not so much the money, it's the drug habit or the gambling habit or somebody who's really hopeless at business and keeps investing in hopeless failures and then keeps taking money and getting into debt that way. You know, there's different reasons for these things, but the real problem is what they're doing wrong there, not so much coming to you for money, it's the, whatever the cause of it all is. So you, that's, sometimes you have to be tough, don't you? If it's someone gambling, you have to say, no, I'm not giving you money because you'll just spend it on the gambling or on the drink or on the drugs or on these silly investments that go wrong. Whatever it is that their problem is, you don't want to keep feeding that. The kindest thing is to stop feeding their habit. You might call it tough love. And they may become very abusive, because I've had this before. I've lent money to drug addicts before, and when you stop, they become really rude, ungrateful, abusive. And it's like, I've given you so much free money. I've never asked, to this day, I've never asked for it back. And still they got angry with me. It's like, what? <laughs> if someone's a very, you know, in a difficult situation, sure, they're in a difficult situation, but if it's of their own making and it's because they're not, behaving very wisely, doesn't mean to say you have to just keep giving them money. You know, maybe it's a, there's a better way here. Maybe you have to stop. But I don't know your details or that person or you, so I don't, you know, I can only give a general, uh, te a general answer here, but sounds like you probably need to stop giving them money and look into them doing something to change their life and Maybe stopping the, giving the money will force that to happen. Sometimes that works. See how you go. Sadhu. Next question. Dear Ajahn, thank you for the bone an analogy. I'm wondering if wanting to do good is also a form of sensual desire, as there's much happiness from generosity and helping. How can I be more careful to not seek sensual pleasure from doing good? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, on the subtle level, yeah, there can be an attachment to doing good, the happiness. You might say the sense of self that arises as we are doing good, helping people and so on. So you also need to keep listening to the Dhamma and developing this perspective of the whole practice and that the whole practice is not dana alone. 
it's what people tend to start with and find attractive. We love to help people, we feel good, and that's good. So there's nothing wrong with that. But it's for a purpose, and, a, and, and it's not an end in itself in the sense we've also got to develop sila, moral restraint, mindfulness of speech and action, and then we've got to develop samadhi, and then we've got to develop insight. Dana alone can't free you from the kilesas, from samsara, can't bring you to nibbana. Insight into the impermanent nature of your five candors will bring you towards nibbana. So you have to get the whole picture in the back of your mind, so that gives you some perspective. So I know quite a few monks who as lay people did lots of dana, and it was good, and they made a, a lot of good karma helping monks, even enlightened monks, but then they re reached a point where they said, it's, it's kind of like, oh, I've done enough of this, it's not really going to get me any further, I've done enough, I've earned enough money, I've shared it, helped the world, I've helped the Sangha, supported various monks and done various good things, but now I have to meditate, and usually the monks are telling them that as well, and they say, oh, yeah. So maybe they start meditating, so they still do dana, of course, but they put also some more energy into their meditation and they're learning the Dhamma and practicing, maybe eventually they become a monk. If you're ready to, if you do a lot of dana, it may bring you to the point where you're ready to enter a monastic lifestyle because you're just giving away to the point where you don't really need to go and get anything more for yourself, so you might as well be a, a monk or a nun. But even as a lay person, maybe you don't reach that point. I would recommend developing your practice in a whole, whole, holistic way, a whole way where you develop sila and samadhi and panya as well as your dharma. It's not an end in itself because you can, like you say, you can get attached to dharma. You know, people can offer a lot of dharma and be very generous, but still get very angry or greedy or deluded. You see it every day, so it's not the whole path, is it? It's a good foundation, but we also have to develop other qualities as well. Sadhu. Uh, just a follow-up comment to the previous question. He says he needs to send the money to his family back home. Yeah, but what is his family back home doing with that money? I knew one lady, she had this problem, keeps getting demands for money, sends the money and found out mum is drinking it all. She loves her mum, she wants to give mum support, but mum is drinking, meaning alcohol, all the money away. So he had to devise a better plan, send the money to a third party, a trusted third party. Don't give it to the person who's asking, because they're often, they've got this weakness, gambling, drinking, something. You send to a third party and they won't like it, but the third party can manage it because they've got eyes on the ground, they're there. They say, oh, you need money for the doctor, let's give you money. You need money for some, some improvement in your life, we can give you that. Need money for drink? No, you don't need money for drink. You need money for gambling? No, you don't need money for gambling. So you need someone to be your fund manager for your person who keeps asking, no, you can't just give, 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 it may be feeding bad habits. This is a general answer again, I don't know your situation, but you may have to look, try and develop a better way to deal with the problem. <laughs> Sadhu. Next question, dear Ajahn, may I ask, would you recommend starting a meditation session with metta meditation before transitioning to breath meditation? Or is it better to do it the other way around? Thank you, Wajan. There's no simple answer here. Both can be good. Uh, it depends partly on your temperament. Myself, I always found just going straight to the breath did the job because it calmed me down. So it's kind of like develops metta at the same time, because any meditation object, you're abandoning the hindrance of ill will. So I found metta arose quite naturally. But I've also found many people who I've taught meditation to benefit from beginning with metta meditation. So you have to observe yourself, see what works for you. 
But you definitely need to develop metta in one way or another, so sometimes at the beginning, sometimes at the end. If you get really good, then it's more like selective, like, oh, this is a time I need to develop metta, and you can be almost, you know, trust yourself to develop it when you need to. But that's maybe for the more advanced meditator, more experienced meditator. But if you find medita metta meditation helps you to calm down, relaxes you, it's a good thing that holds your attention and you've, you're willing to do it, well, yeah, begin your meditation with it. That's fine. But there's always room for a bit of change or adaptation. Just, just see what works and, and then develop your meditation from there. Sadhu. Next question. Dear Ajahn, with the Buddha's immense compassion and wisdom, why did he hesitate to teach the Dhamma after enlightenment? Well, from what we know, he thought this Dhamma is profound and deep. Is there really going to be anyone who can understand it? You have to think the Buddha couldn't find a teacher. He had looked all the best meditators in India, he couldn't find anyone to teach him. They, they taught him some things, they helped him in, to some degree, but he couldn't find anyone to teach him what he had done himself. He's a Sama Sambuddha, so he's self-enlightened. He's reached Nibbana, which is a profoundly different experience for the human mind than any other, anything else in the world. And no one could teach him that. So at first he thought, hmm, maybe no one's really going to do this. Because he also knows how hard it is. You know, it requires effort, practice. So I think, you know, you might say the easy thing, although there's nothing easy for an Arahant or an enlightened Buddha, but the easy way is to sit there and enjoy, which is what he did, isn't it? He sat under the Bodhi tree enjoying the fruits of his enlightenment. And because he didn't have a teacher, it's like, I did this myself. So it's like, all he could do was to be grateful to the Dhamma, which is very impersonal. Dhamma is not a person, is it? He was grateful to the Dhamma, because that's what got him to Nibbana. So it's like, oh, the Dhamma has helped me. For us, it's a little more obvious. You know, you've, we've got a Buddha, the Dhamma and Sangha as well. Enlightened beings have come before us. So in a way, it's like, oh, We've got these refugees, brings up gratitude and compassion, and maybe we say, oh, there's Sangha, I, if I'm becoming enlightened, well, maybe I can also teach other Sangha and help other people. It's perhaps more obvious for us. But for the Buddha, he's in a unique situation. <clears throat> so his first thought, as far as we know, is, oh, this is a difficult way to practice, it's, there may be only few people or no people who could understand this. So it's like, oh, let's just enjoy the fruits of enlightenment. But then Brahma Sahampati, his old friend from past life, comes down and says, please, out of compassion, can you teach? And the Buddha knows from his past life as Bodhisattva that he has had that aspiration to teach for the benefit of everyone. We say for the benefit of many folk, meaning for everyone. The Buddha has been driven by that thought for many lifetimes. So even though his enlightenment experience meant there's no more attachment, no more need to do anything, but he's also aware he had been practicing with that thought in mind life after life. So it's like, ah, yes. Now Brahma Sahambadi has invited me. It's appropriate to teach. So it's just like a little nudge to the Buddha that's needed because the Buddha is actually equanimous after enlightenment. He's just sitting there equanimous. But Rama Sahampati just stirs the compassion. Okay, now I can teach. And lucky he did, didn't he? Otherwise we'll all be in trouble. <laughs> so he can also thank Rama Sahampati. If he hadn't done, given the Buddha the prompt, then, you know, the Buddha would have just, maybe, you know, oh, well, it gets too complicated. But anyway, we can be thankful to the Buddha and Brahma Sahampati. <laughs> so this may be our second to last question. Dear Ajahn, I have just 
started volunteering to serve in the elderly sector recently. I couldn't help but feel saddened when I see the elder folks playing mahjong or card games to pass time. Deep down within me, I see myself judging them and making a comparison with myself. For example, thoughts arose in me. This is really a waste of time and I don't wish to spend my own age like this. I sense my defilements as well as compassion that isn't pure. How can I exercise compassion towards the elderly by not judging them in this way and also to purify this befriending process to make it a wholesome one? Well, it's a good observation. Um, but if you are working <laughs> in the elderly sector, uh, I'm entering, entering the elderly sector. doesn't sound very attractive, does it? I'm now a sector. <laughs> anyway, with older people, um, you have to accept they're older people. They've lived their life. They maybe aren't going to change very much now. So whatever good they do have, good conditions, good qualities in themselves, appreciate them. And wherever they are, maybe lost or wasting their time or they have bad habits, well, cultivate compassion for them on that level and use it as a learning experience for yourself. So if you see other people who are spending their, using their intelligence to win at mahjong, <laughs> which, you know, it's a game that requires you to think and watch and learn, you could say there's something in it, some good qualities there, but you know, it is a bit pointless, like you say. So you see them doing that, or you say, well, I also have intelligence, I also could play mahjong, but I'm, what am I going to do? Ah, I'm going to read the Dhamma, listen to the Dhamma, I'm going to learn to meditate, practice mindfulness, and see what I can do to help other people as well. So turn it back on yourself, whatever you learn from these people, you see the good, where you can appreciate, you see the bad, well, you, suffer, you, you, you feel sorry for them for the bad that they do or have done. But then come back to yourself. What am I going to do? When I get old, how am I going to practice? How am I going to deal with the endless hours of not being able to go anywhere? What am I going to do? I'm going to meditate, listen to Dhamma, make some plans based on what you're learning. So use it as a learning experience and you may become very skilled in your old age in how to deal with old age wisely. I would recommend to do that. We just don't know how long we've got, so see your time as precious, but try not to be too harsh on them. You know, Many good people play mahjong, and I'm not saying they should play mahjong, I'm just saying, what do you do when you're old? You know, if you haven't trained in Buddhism, what are you gonna do? Or you just sit there watching TV, playing mahjong, that's what people do, isn't it? Learn your lesson and try to use your time the best you can. Sadhu. Next question. Good evening, Lumpur. As mentioned by Ajahn Chah in his biography, Stillness Flowing. Sorry, no. Uh, as mentioned by Ajahn Chah, Stillness flowing refers to the steadiness of the mind from samatha and the flowing refers to wisdom resulting from vipassana. Sometimes samatha leads and sometimes vipassana leads depending on conditions. Both samatha and vipassana support one another. Is this the correct understanding? Uh, they definitely support one another. Stillness flowing is, is clear that the word stillness comes before the word flowing. So maybe that's a clue. To really be able to practice vipassana, we need to pay attention, be mindful, be aware. You might call that the stillness of the mind. And vipassana in the beginning is often a bit patchy, isn't it? You, you can see the impermanence of a thought, but you're still lost in that thought and on it goes. Your mind is not yet really very wise or letting go of defilements yet. You're just kind of feeling your way, working out what's going on because the samatha is perhaps not very strong yet. 
you know, you do your vipassana retreat and your mind is all over the place and you say, oh yeah, I can see thoughts are impermanent, feelings are impermanent, but that's just talking to yourself or remembering the, the words and the teachings. So the samatha is actually very important, but it takes time for most people, unless you've done it a lot in a past life. It's going to take a long time, so keep working at it. But you don't just have to do samatha or develop this, the mindfulness. You know, you, when you feel calm enough, then you go out into more observation and, and reflection on what's going on, the thoughts that are arising, the sensations in your body. But just be aware, not very long, when your mindfulness is weak or samatha is weak, not very long and your vipassana will just descend into normal thinking and back caught into moods and the normal kind of <clears throat> distracted states of mind, excuse me, <clears throat> it won't take long for your vipassana to sort of degenerate, will it, if we're honest. So come back to the samatha. But how much time you spend on your samatha, how much on the vipassana varies from person to person. There's absolutely, there's no one description here that I think fits all. So some people probably more people need to put more effort into their samatha. Just make the one-pointedness, the mind very one-pointed as much as you can. But that's not to diminish or overlook the importance of vipassana because ultimately insight is what abandons defilement from your mind. It's just it needs the mindfulness from samatha to do that. So these two things, like you say, they work together. The two parts of the whole, or the same mind, different sides of the same mind. But just be honest and observe what's going on, and you'll notice you know, what you might call vipassana. If mindfulness is not there, it's just thinking and mumbling to yourself and <laughs> talking about stuff and remembering stuff. But when your mind is very still from the mindfulness, then maybe you have some new insights. And you say, mm, yeah, this is the real insight, because it changes you. Real insight, real vipassana, will change you at least a little bit. Something will change in the way you're viewing yourself, your body, your mind, the world. Something changes. Those changes may be very slight, very incremental, very just small, but there's some change going on and maybe one day you can look back and say mm, things have changed some people maybe the the changes are very fast and dramatic okay occasionally that happens but a lot of it is more incremental gradual you just have to accept that but it needs both it needs the mindfulness and just the insight the observation and insight coming from a place of mindfulness stillness they work together I think that is the last question for tonight. Okay, a lot of questions tonight, so very nice talking to you, and uh, if any of this Dhamma has been useful to you, then that's good. And please keep up your practice. Over the next few weeks, um, we may not be able to do the Zoom session every week. We certainly will return to doing the Zoom sessions, but... Uh, there may be some interruption because I have to travel to other monasteries for katina sessions, katina ceremonies.